Hello, I'm Lux. And I'm Ember. And we just binge watched season three, episodes one through seven of Voltron Legendary Defender. Yes, we're crazy. So don't be surprised if we're a little tipsy, because man, you get high off of watching this stuff. This was what I was trying to avoid the entire time we were planning on watching Voltron. I'm like, let's not binge watch it this time. But we kind of succeeded. We watched an episode, then it was interrupted by the day. We watched another episode. Actually, we weren't really interrupted. We put breaks in because we had to take care of other stuff. But then we watched episode four, and then five, and then six, and then seven. Yeah, because it was the evening and it's like, are we really going to accomplish anything else? And it's the weekend. We can afford to stay up, right? Also, if you hear any noises, Kitten found her toy. <laughs> One of many. I, I can't bring myself to take them from her while we're recording. Say hello, Kitten. Yeah, she doesn't do commands. She's just... There she goes again. <laughs> she does commands. It's just speak is not one of them. <laughs> She's being quite funny right now playing with it. She did the whole kitty butt move thing, you know, when they're about to pounce on something. But back to the actual Voltron, just ignore that in the background. <laughs> yes, yes, let's deal with the Black Lion from the show, not the Black Panther in the living room. Also, I have some theories about Shiro. One of them is that the Shiro we have may actually be a clone with implanted memories. Good theory. In Episode one, where Keith had the flashback of the final battle and them not finding Shiro. I was like, oh, why didn't I think of this before? And my thought was that Shiro got absorbed into Zarkon because they interacted on the ethereal plane where both physical and mental interact. Because that's like how they stole the Bayard. So for a while I was thinking that Zarkon wasn't waking up because Zarkon and Shiro were fighting for control of the body. Good theory, but not true. Yeah, I'll well, see if my theory is true. Be kind of interesting. And this show just keeps getting better, mainly because they got a real interesting villain this time, Prince Lothwar. Oh my God! I'm like, he's evil, but I like him. Villainy with style. You want to hate a villain, but you also want to like him because of just how good he is. Yes, Zarkon's narrow-minded focus made him a rather one-dimensional villain. Though we got more dimensions added to him in this season. Yes, now that he's out of play and Prince Lotor is taking the lead. And what a lead it is. His four generals are kicktail ladies. Quite. And notice there's a total of five of them, including Lothor. So it's a good balance for the paladins. Apparently I've been saying Prince Lotor's name. Lotor name? It doesn't sound right when I say it that way. Prince Lotor's name. Wrong this entire time. The prince guy. The evil one. Okay. Notice there's five of them compared to the five paladins. I think he's building his own Voltron. And I think that one ship we saw in this episode is only one of five. Because to me it looked like two arms. Very much so, but it also looked very similar to Prince Lotor's fighter because it had that similar mobility of what we saw on the gas planet with the wings operating independently and a high level of mobility. Normally a ship that size doesn't move that quickly. I'm thinking they still took that basic design and I think they've built something that's basically a counterpoint to Voltron, their own Voltron. And I think it has nothing to do with what everyone thinks it has to do with. He's not trying to go to another dimension to get more quintessence. He sees the benefits of how Voltron works. He wants his own symbol to rally his people behind. As far as we know, Lotor isn't obsessed with quintessence. We now know why Zarkon and Hagar were. And the real question is, is he really a prince? Because his age just kind of throws everything off because there was no signs that they had a kid during the flashback. But if they had Lotor afterwards, wouldn't the quintessence that's already infused their bodies affect any child that Hagar happened to give birth to? Yeah, that's the thing, though. I'm saying he'd be different than he is now. Yes, he'd probably still be as young, but I'm saying he wouldn't be as... It's hard to say this about a villain, but as normal as he is compared to what Hagar and Zarkon look like. I mean, look at both of them. Hagar 
used to look a lot more Altaian, and Zarkon used to look more like a normal Golra. So he is a half-breed himself, so I was right about that at the beginning. I was like, yeah, he's a half-breed. He doesn't look like anyone else. Also, wonderful introduction. I'm like, that guy fighting now in the ring? Yeah, that's Lotor. Lux and I were both saying that at almost the exact same moment. Since they're kind of probably bouncing all over the place. They kind of should have done some research, though four days is kind of pushing it. But there's this thing called the rule of threes when it comes to human survival. Three minutes without air, you're dead. Three days without water, you're dead. Three weeks without food, you're dead. So specifically referencing Shiro's time in the Golra fighter when he's trying to get back to Voltron, the final entry says that he's seven days out. No fuel, no food, no water, no oxygen. Yeah, and that's another thing that made me go, hmm. Also the fact that he stopped that crab on his own. Mostly. Yeah, I'm just talking about the fact that he grabbed the whole claws and things and like, yeah, I can understand it with the robotic arm, but he was using both arms. It's kind of like the whole, when you watch the Bionic Man TV series, you realize there's a problem here where the arms connected to the body is still human. And that's a weak point that's not going to hold up as well. Yeah. So you couldn't really lift a truck as the Bionic Man, and you can only throw something as fast as the shoulder would allow you. Which could still be pretty fast. Look at some MLB pitchers. I'm saying some of the stuff he did in the series is like, the whole entire right side of the body would have had to be replaced for that to be even remotely possible. But back to the science fiction of Voltron. But yeah, I'm like, I don't think this is really Shiro. I'm thinking it's a clone with modifications that looks and thinks it's Shiro, especially since they let him go. When we're pretty sure this time there's no more Blade of Malmora on the ship. Because that's how he got away the first time. And it was interesting, the mix of flashes, because some of it seemed to be faint memories of his first imprisonment, but other portions of it seemed to be new memories of an experiment, stage one, stage two, stage three. And so if he was let go at stage three, what was the end goal? I also, I think there was a spot where he was actually looking into another room with another Shiro or the real Shiro. Ooh, interesting, interesting. Because if he was seeing the image as a flashback, I wouldn't really think much about the camera angle because television and movies does that all the time, where you see the flashback from the third person perspective, even though it should be from the first person perspective. But that's an interesting point because a clone implanted with memories would have the memory that that's a blade of Malmora, but it wouldn't have that memory at that time because it wouldn't have happened yet. There's parts of it where I think it's supposed to be memories, but there's also parts of it where I think it was actually during the escape. He looked into a room and there was another Shiro. So yeah, I have this inkling that it's a clone. <laughs> well, you know, there's always interesting stuff going on with the Black Lion pilots. Things got creative in the US Voltron. I think it was a little more uh, violently cut and dry and go lion. And speaking of that, I love the next reference. Alternate dimensions for the win. Yes. Hey, Sven. Yes, we had Spin, and we had the reference to the next hospital planet. Because <laughs> that's where everyone always went. Nobody died in Voltron. They just went to the medical planet. And this is not a missile full of people. <laughs> If they manage to do that in this series, actually have a missile full of people, I'm all like, well, that's a reference we didn't really need, but it's awesome. <laughs> I'd be like, how did they get this past the... Oh, yeah, it's on Netflix. And speaking of Netflix, why, why did you have to go and chop up the season like that? Would it have killed you to put the whole season out of once? Though, considering the binge watching, it might have killed us. Yeah, yeah, but still, like, like was it nice? Because we, we met some people at AnimeCon who actually know the people who worked on Voltron, and apparently they were ticked off when this happened, which is kind of odd for Netflix to do, because Netflix usually goes, here's money, have fun. Yeah, so it's interesting that they chopped the season and held it like this. It's really not Netflix's M.O. Though they have been tightening the purse strings lately, from what I understand. Well, you know, they're losing Disney, so they got to get creative. 
So back to Voltron, and oh my god, you show is pretty. The art style is just so rock solid. And then moving on to, yes, she's a pilot now. I'm a leg! <laughs> <laughs> yes, everyone is finally in their correct lions with their correct mismatching outfit colors. I love the reasoning for the pink outfit, but I also love the reasoning of how they all got to their own lions. Just the way they handled that was good. It was really nice because, I mean, if you watch Voltron, you knew that Keith was going to be the one to take the black lion. And you knew that Lance was going to have to switch over to the red lion because that's just the way it works. And Allura would end up taking blue. But the thing was, when Allura won blue, it wasn't while she was standing there after Lance ran off. She won blue while she was talking to Red. That plea of wanting to help and needing to do this and honoring her father's legacy and, you know, refusing to step back and let others take on all the damage. Yeah, because it can happen anywhere when you win over the lions. Like how Lance wins over Red by going, I am going to be your basically right arm man. Because Red is the hardest to earn the trust of in this version. The lions weren't quite this uh, sentient in the original Voltron. Though in a way they were actually more sentient because in the original Voltron, when you go back to Go Lions original, they were their own entity that kind of tried to do too much power and got broken apart because of it. Yeah, so differing stories between Go Lion and Voltron, which anyone who's looked at either series knows quite well. And it's nice that this show is taking references from both. We also got to see the creation of the lions in this season. And the whole real story behind that. Just this entire season is packed with very well done exposition. Because it's lightly sprinkled throughout these seven episodes. It makes you wonder what they did in the next set of episodes. Because I don't know how long this season was supposed to be. I'm thinking it was probably the standard 13 that they've been doing. You would think so. So this is just slightly past the halfway mark which means it's time for things to ramp up even more because Hagar is about to go quintessence crazy to get Zarkon back. Lotor is working on his Voltron counterpart and we have the Voltron team trying to figure out how to deal with all of this. And really, what's left for Shiro now? He's not Altaian, so he can't command the ship and handle that. The Black Lion won't speak to him anymore. So he's definitely not a paladin. Well, here's the thing. If he's not the real Shiro, maybe the only reason the Black Lion found him is because he's similar to what Keith was looking for. That's possible. And it's possible that the Black Lion didn't respond because he's a clone. It's also possible the Black Lion didn't respond because the newest set of experiments put some sort of gall taint on him. Or just something that... Not really a taint, but something that made him unworthy. Yes, because it sounded like the plan was called Koran. It, sound, it sounded like it started with a C sound. It was definitely a C sound. Also, I think there was a hint that there's something in his head when... The reference to he can't get rid of that headache. So there's definitely something implanted, whether it's a compulsion, a suggestion, an actual physical piece of druid tech. Hard to say. Also, Lotor makes an interesting point. Voltron can't be everywhere. It's one symbol. When people join the coalition of Voltron, they're still expected to defend themselves. But when they stay with the Golra Empire, hmm. they have the Golra to look after them. Yeah, it's just the way he's doing things. It just another idea slash theory just struck me. What if Lotor's actually a good guy he could be because he repeatedly orders his generals not to kill and what if he's actually like a founding member of the blade the blade of balmar now that's an interesting thought yeah that's that's hmm Ooh, the theories percolate <laughs> hmm. do you have any other theories you'd like to go over that i was like I wonder if I've jogged any new ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an interesting thought, because at the very least, he is choosing leadership in a different way. 
because by going through and assimilating the planets instead of subjugating them, you don't have to watch your back as much, which means that your resources go further. You're not spending all of your soldiers continuing to subjugate the people you already conquered. Basically like, okay, you're part of the Alliance now, so we're going to show up every so often, collect some taxes, and you advise us if you need some help, you know, defending against anybody that's not us. So it's basically leaving them alone, but still being able to collect on their resources. Because it's interesting, because it just means like if he's building his own Voltron, maybe he's not building it to attack Voltron, but maybe he's building it as his own symbol. It's going to be real, real interesting because maybe he knows how crazy his, if they are his parents, are. And he wants to get rid of them and bring the Gullar Empire back to what they should be. Maybe not even like to fight against Voltron or anything, but just to make the Gullar Empire back to at least a civilized group of people. Instead of all this bloodlust and conquest and constant quest for quintessence. Because we saw that that's what they did to some of the planets, is they just drained them completely of quintessence and left behind a husk. The writers are doing an excellent job. Netflix, pay them more. <laughs> Don't do stupid stuff. See what happens when you give them money? Good things. These are the Legend Korra people. You give them time and money, they produce good stuff. Also, this is the first season that didn't have anything that felt like... Legend of Korra, or Avatar The Last Airbender, because the last two seasons had a lot of stuff where we're like, this felt like it's something that belonged in Avatar or Legend of Korra. Very much so, because you could trace back all the characters, a lot of the reactions, a lot of how things played out. You can look online, people have made the Paladins and Delora into the appropriate categories of benders, so we're not the only ones seeing the connections. But this season so far didn't feel like that at all they finally are getting it to its own stride it's enough of its own universe it's it's so good when you see it just right <laughs> he's doing the hand gesture and everything folks it's an old meme sir but it checks out uh look at my tumblr you'll, you'll see what i'm talking about <laughs> <laughs> so what was your favorite part of these seven episodes I have to pick one. Parts. Favorite parts. The whole thing with Sven and Slav and, you know, the wonderfulness that Allura can see how peace and not fighting can also go horribly, horribly wrong. Because, oh my god, those Altaeans were scary. Yes. I would rather take my chances with the Galra, thank you. I also like, I love this reality. <laughs> yes, because this is the one reality where this works. <laughs> Uh, this is the one reality where everything goes right. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Because I know this is the reality where everything works out. <laughs> Which is an awesome thing to find out, but kind of sucks a little bit for the reality that we go back to because they took the comet through the breach, which allowed the Golra Empire to get the comet. So they had the comet, they have part of a teledub. They got stuff going on. Especially since apparently only Altaeans can operate that stuff. So... Lotor. He's part Altaean. But he stole it. The Golra Empire had it first, which means Hagar. Well, it got stolen and then they got blown up. But I'm saying for original purposes, that means Hagar. Mm-hmm. Interesting stuff. Yes. Now, also, I know the two of them are a little crazy from overexposure to quintessence, but I think Zarkon was actually infected by those creatures that came through the rift. If you look at the differences in their eye colors after their revival, Zarkons correlate to the creatures and Hagar's correlate to the quintessence. I thought they both correlated to the creatures because they both were purple in color. No, when they glowed. Yeah, they both were purple purple in color i seem to remember no apparently hagars were yellow yes at least once hmm gonna have to watch the episodes again one moment here <laughs> no, no no at least not tonight uh no but mostly just going back to a particular scene and just going 
I told you they were purple. Or, god dang it, they were yellow. Also, the interesting touch that one of Lotor's generals was the Golra that Keith ran into inside the Weblum. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I had a theory at one point that that was his mother. I thought about that too for Keith, especially during that season. But it's really interesting because the only reason for a Golra to be inside a Weblum is to get Skulltrite. And you use Skulltrite to do things like make the Teledub. So apparently Lothar has had this idea for a while. Well, he has been apparently exiled, which means that he didn't agree with his parents. And basically he was sent off to the far corners of the universe at the edge of the Empire, where apparently he's been making a name for himself by not following standard Golra subjugation procedures. Though he has learned the fine art of manipulation quite well. He won over most of the crowd in that first episode, and was full aware of how he was doing it, because he even replies to his generals, the masses are easily swayed. Also, dang the boy is pretty. Quite. I mean, Lotor in the American 80s Voltron and Go Lion was pretty boy designed for the time. Lotor's just pretty boy. Oh yeah, definitely good looking. But explain what design it reminds me of, I can't place my finger on it, but like probably an anime or a video game I've seen. Just maybe while the time I was like, I, I know he reminds me of something. He's just pretty enough to fit within something. Where have I seen his face before? Jokingly cuts over to a cereal box. That's it! <laughs> Turn the cereal box around. See, he's this missing boy. Okay. <sighs> Lost. Please return to family. Dead or alive? <laughs> Ouch. But no, I have that feeling, too, that he strikes up more familiarity just than, oh, this is the new version of Lotor. There seems to be more to it than that. Also, the boy is just devious as all get out. Yes, the way he set the guy from episode one up. Yes, we'll make up, and then we'll post him to this outpost. And then we'll have the Golra Empire punish him for the stuff that we stole. Devious. Quite. And I mean, you get that he's fully aware of the depth of that machination in that final scene because they pan out to him standing there looking all pleased with himself. I don't know what that boy's planning, but it's going to be very fun to watch. Quite. And it's also interesting that one of Lotor's generals has Hagar's cat. So when I first saw the cat, I was like, oh, it's about time she showed up. Hagar always has her cat. And it's been missing for two seasons. Because apparently Lotor's general has it. Apparently. Also, this general can control people. So when she's looking through the cat's eyes, is she controlling the cat or just looking through the cat's eyes? Hmm. Don't know. And is that lady, even though Hagar asked someone to go and spy for her, is that blind lady with the cat actually a spy for her? Could be. So if Hagar and Zarkon is his parents, he never called Hagar mother or anything like that. No, he referred to Zarkon as his father, but he made no reference to a mother. But if you look at how th things have played out for the last two seasons, Hagar doesn't exactly serve as a consort. She serves as an underling. And she didn't remember that she was married to him until the end of this season, or well, the end of these episodes. She actually changes her voice a little bit too. If you notice that at the end of this episode where she wakes up Zarkon. Yes, it's very, very intriguing. I can definitely see why the writers were like, you're going to do what? Kind of like the people who did DuckTales. You're going to do what? We had these episodes written in a certain order. Disney. I'm guessing Disney probably said, you were going to release them in this order, Disney. And then you go and do something stupid like, well, little kids won't, won't remember these characters and they want to see their favorite characters again. So if we introduce this character, we have to make sure the next episode will have that character again or the little stupid kids are going to forget. No, they don't forget. They have their parents play the episodes 50 billion times. No, they don't forget. Trust me, at that age, they are sponges. So if you want to keep their attention, just keep releasing episodes in the proper order, Disney. Because kids will notice. They ain't dumb. 
This is what networks kind of realize. Your public isn't dumb. They can genuinely be stupid, but they're not dumb. Especially when you watch the internet. <laughs> You're like, how did, how, how did you? In the age of the internet where someone's watching very closely. Great example of this is Gravity Falls. <laughs> yes, where the writers put in a message in the background of an episode that you could only get by taking certain letters that went by during a running sequence. And they were like, oh, nobody will ever find this 30 minutes later on the internet. So yeah, Disney, you don't have to worry. <laughs> Just release good content in the way it was meant to be released and your audience will stick with you. It may not be the audience you intended, cough my little pony, but it will be an audience that will pay you money. Yes, because to sidetrack from Voltron and Netflix and stay on Disney just a little bit longer. Right now, Disney, you're keeping us from watching DuckTales because we know what has been released is in the wrong order. So we can't watch your show until all the episodes come out and we're able to assemble them in the correct order. So you're stopping us from watching your programming. Legally, I might add. Because we were perfectly fine watching it through your mostly working app. And don't get me started on how the Cartoon Network app works. No, no, we'll talk about that in the Steven Universe episode. I'm not even sure if it's Chromecast compatible at this point. I just know, I'm like, wait, wait, wait. When I first log into you, you're going to give me a random assortment of episodes from shows I choose. Then I have to have that start playing. Then I get to tap on a button that says all shows. Then pick the show I want to watch. Then I have to log into my satellite account just to get access to them in order. <laughs> Moving on. Yes. And so now we have this similar thing with Netflix of, okay, we've watched the first seven episodes. You're stopping us from watching your show because you haven't posted the remaining episodes. So we're not patronizing your channel right now because you are blocking the, us from accessing the content by not releasing completed content. But we should actually get back to the show itself. Yes. See, this is what happens when we're tired. <laughs> Speaking of the show, any points you want to go over? Any actual nitpicks? Any story plot holes you may have seen? Well, I want to go back to the first episode because we need to touch on the inhabitants of the freed planet's reaction to the Blade of Malmora member being there looking all Galra and very nice of him to reveal his identity because the rest of the blades are still working undercover. But he's taken on the mantle of being a representative and so has to show himself as he is. And they were mentioned throughout the rest of the episodes, but they weren't really shown much. So it's going to be interesting if they're showing up in the episodes that are released after this. Well, they mentioned how thin the blades were scattered. But we had several references after those first episodes, like when they took out that outpost and they said, let the blade know, this one has been cleared. Like I said, they're mentioned, it's just they're not shown except in that one episode. So I guess there's a difference between things that take a combination of Voltron lions and the blades versus things that can only be handled by the Voltron team. I also liked how when we had the changeovers in the lions that Everyone was having difficulty because the lions do actually handle differently because they all have different specialties. So Keith switching to black, black's slower. Lance taking red, red is so much faster than blue. And Allura with blue, blue operates completely differently than flying the castle. And, you know, if you look at how things played out, Lotor actually helped them because he worked on drawing them out. He saw, hmm, they're inexperienced. These aren't the same paladins who took out my father. All of his lines, if you think about it, can be twisted to be a good thing. I think I'm on to something. <laughs> <laughs> because when he was chasing down Allura and she started to get better, he was like, hmm, someone's learning. I know, right? Just think about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And when she froze the wing... And he couldn't get it to work. He was like, well played and took off. And he's spending all his time telling his generals, we need more information. And they're going, but we could have taken them there, but we need to know more. 
if you're just going to capture them and or destroy them, why do you need to know more? Just hit them when they're down and be done with it. There's also the possibility that if he is building his own thing, he needs to know more about how they function. But still, I'm like, I think he's a good guy. Well, that makes me feel better about liking him, but still. <laughs> I don't know that he's a good guy, but he's not the same level of bad guy as Zarkon. Because now we understand a lot more of Zarkon's obsessions. Because by the end of season two, we understood the obsession with the Black Lion. Now we understand the obsession with Quintessence and the overall battle. Because King Alfor did technically destroy his homeworld. For a very good reason, but... Yeah, but I don't think Zarkon got that part of it before he went on national television and told the Gulras to rise up and start a war. And the Gulra people themselves may not have understood. Hmm. You know, when they were evacuated. Especially considering that King Alfor held a state funeral for the two of them. And then suddenly they're alive? So now Alfor looks like a liar. Because he declared the two of them dead. Hmm. Once again, I'd like to point out these writers are really dang good. This is the reason that Avatar did so well. And if you also look, that's the reason that even through everything Nickelodeon put them through, how good Korra was. Yeah, considering the limitations that got put on them, they managed to do a lot within those limitations. I'd also like to point out it's interesting how the color scheme of each of the paladin's races match the lions they ended up with. So it's like, did Alford deliberately choose those colors expecting that each of them would pilot a particular color? Or was that incidental? Because he said, you know, you don't choose the beast, the beast chooses you. Maybe as he was building them, that's the colors they ended up as. He didn't choose them. He just went, okay, you're yellow. <laughs> the gosh darn pen is blue! Because <laughs> it's actually a rather interesting contrast because green went to green, blue went to blue, but Elfor actually piloted the red lion and his color was actually yellow. And Zarkon got the black lion, while Golra's skin is on the darker side. If you look at Zarkon's armor at the time, it was red. So yes, both Alfor and the original yellow paladin had more of a yellow color scheme. Because hmm. he had the gold chasing in his armor and the coloring on his cloak. And then the other paladins basically looked like... Okay, take the current paladins and make them aliens. Because, think about it. They even had the mannerisms. The green pilot was even a girl. And the blue paladin was flirting with everyone in sight. Yeah, everyone, even the guys. Did you catch that? Yeah. Yeah, so absolutely everyone. And Zarkon was trying to maintain some semblance of order. It almost fit too well. And it was interesting that Alfor seemed to be the most in tune with his lion. You would think that the ideas for forming Voltron and for drawing the sword, well, at least the forming Voltron would have gone to the Black Lion's paladin. Hmm. But both ideas went to the Red Lion paladin, where only the sword should have, because the sword is held by the red lion because the sword is the right hand. Hmm. Crazy idea. What if they're using this to kind of mirror how Shiro and Keith went? Where how Keith ended up becoming the black lion pilot. And L4 was originally the red lion pilot because Zarkon was a better military leader. Hmm. Was there another paladin? After Zarkon changed sides and they managed to keep the black lion from going with him, did they get a fifth pilot? Were they still able to form Voltron at the end? Or were they only defending the lions? And that's why King Alfor split the lions up and sent them away, because they didn't have enough paladins to form Voltron. Hmm. I'm almost thinking that the king would have ended up becoming the Black Lion's pilot after that. It's very possible. And with everything that we think we know about how the war went before Alfor sent the lions away... 
they must have still been able to form Voltron. Up to a point. Interesting. Also, I like that Allura can fight and, okay, it's really stereotypical for her to have a whip and be in pink, but she does it well. Yes, and the whip can cut through things. That's really handy. Yes, yes it is. Why didn't it cut through that gun? Different material. Maybe it's based on intent. Hmm. So when she wants it to cut, it cuts. When she wants it to bind, it binds. Kind of like a paper master. Yeah, kind of like that. I also like the scene where she was fighting against the strong lady from the guards. And the lady's like, ooh, I like someone who, <laughs> who can give me a challenge. I look forward to crushing you. And because, you know, she's this big thing and Alora is this tiny little thing. She just goes, pull. Same strength as me. I like her. <laughs> this is going to be fun. Also, I love how well most of the team takes care of itself. Lance is all ready to, you know, start taking people out from his sniper position. And they just start rolling out. Not that he isn't still helpful, but he thought he'd be making the first move. And he wasn't. And it wasn't until they were all fully engaged that he was actually able to step in. Because once they're all engaged, they don't have the spare energy to watch their backs as much. I like how he took out the door and a couple other people, like another sniper across the way. Always important to get the other sniper. Yeah, because sniper, no sniping. Oh man. Uh, never watched an episode of the show in my life. <laughs> Me either. Thank God. But moving on. Uh, I think maybe wrap things up. We can do that. We can we can do that. This thing is going to be a beast to edit. I just know it. But to wrap things up, what are your final thoughts on these seven episodes? Really engaging. Even though I don't know for sure where we're ending up, I like where we're going with it. I love the callbacks and references, getting in Spin, the medical planet, all the stuff with Shiro, the changing of the lions. Because now we have reasons for why the paladin outfits don't match the colors of the lions. Because there's no point in them switching outfits. And they're not going to be like, oh, here, um... Alora, I've been wearing this for a couple months, but here, you take it. Um, Keith, can I have your clothes? <laughs> There's no point for that at this. Except for fan fiction writers. <laughs> Keith, can I have your clothes? That's an entirely different scenario. And speaking of Keith and Lance, I like how Lance came to Keith like that to talk about, you know, um, we have six qualified paladins and I'm thinking I'm the weakest link, so I'm going to bail. And Keith's like, don't worry about it. The lion chose you. Shut up and go away. Basically like, believe in yourself. You're good. Just keep doing what we do. Everything will work itself out. Also, l leave the math to Pidge. I also love the scene where, um, I have no idea what those two were just saying. I know. It was so interesting to see Pidge and Hunk both communicating on the same level. Because usually Pidge talks techno jargon and Everybody's lost. I also like Koran talking to the mice and admitting like, I don't understand what you're saying, but, but the way you were... <laughs> but the tone of it... <laughs> I'm assuming that was an insult. Yes, I'm, as you can tell, I'm also quite enjoying this series. I like where they're going with it. I've got several theories. Please rewind and watch those theories again. And again. When you come back here again, go back, watch it again. Yeah, it's going to kind of be like that time loop from the episode in season two, except you're not going to get younger every time you go back, and your pet isn't going to morph into some other kind of animal. So yeah, these seven episodes are solid. Can't wait for more. And this has been our thoughts on Voltron, Legendary Defender, season three, episodes one through seven. Thanks for listening. If you're all the way here at the outro, Thanks for sticking with us. If you skipped ahead to the outro, I'm not sure why, but thank you. If you enjoy this content, you can find more of it. There's a ton on our channel. Not all of it is this long, but we're starting to have a collection of longer episodes. I'm wondering if maybe we should make a playlist of all our longest episodes. Right now we are maintaining a twice a week update schedule. Ember's Reading Room on Wednesdays, and This Random Nonsense on Saturdays. 
If you enjoy Lex's art, you can find more of it on Tumblr, Twitter, DeviantArt, Facebook, Google+, a couple Mastodon servers, occasionally Reddit, and wherever else he can find to post and go, look at my pretty pictures, please, pretty please. If you really like Lex's art and would like some of your own, he does do that difficult work of taking that picture in your head and trying to turn it into a digital reality. Check the link below for pricing and availability. Want to help support us but don't have a particular image in mind? We do take funds directly without repatriation, though Patreon does give you some perks, including uh, voting rights on monthly sketches. We also have coffee, which works in increments of three and doesn't require a repeated pledge. It is great for those one-time users who just want to leave a tip. Thank you again for listening.